Welcome back here with the Forbes India Show. We're talking to Sir Suma Chakrabarti, the President of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Let me just come to India. You've been meeting with uh, CEOs of Indian companies who you've hopefully been trying to uh, get invest with the EBR. What, what, what are they telling you about the economy? Because what we've had the finance minister worried about and is that Indian companies haven't just started or they haven't restarted the investment cycle in India. So what's holding them back and how optimistic are they? Yeah, I think it's quite a mixed picture from many of the companies we've talked about. So many of the larger companies are actually, they haven't got a problem in terms of investing in the domestic economy. Mm -hmm. They're doing pretty well. Um, it's more of an issue actually with more med medium uh, scale companies from what I hear. And, you know, they say that uh, the inv investment rate in India has fallen, as the finance minister has pointed out, for a number of reasons. I mean, you know, if you look at the World Bank's doing business survey, India is still stuck in, well, I think, 132nd in the, in the survey. Um, so it's not doing as well as Turkey or China or even Russia. And for a number of reasons, well-known reasons to any Indian who wants to invest, uh, starting up a new company is quite difficult in India, a lot of bureaucratic hurdles, enforcing contracts can be quite difficult, getting a construction permit can be very, very difficult. So, and the infrastructure. Uh, now, on the infrastructure, I think actually the finance minister did have some very good things to say in the budget, and he knows that's a, cr a crucial issue uh, going forward. But these are obstacles which uh, make it difficult to get the investment rate up very quickly. But they're all issues that I think he has always been committed to tackling, and I think he will. Well, one of the issues that he had right up there when he, uh, in his mind when he went and made the speech was the possibility of a downgrade. Uh, downgrade from investment to junk. How serious would have that been if it had happened? Would you still be interested in the country? We know that Britain just got a downgrade, but that just brought it, I think, on par with countries like yeah. other countries in, in Western Europe and, in, uh, and with America. But in India, if it had moved out from investment to junk, mm. How serious would that have been? Well, I don't think it would be a good thing, but at the same time, for EBRD, the sort of companies we want to invest in, their ratings would matter a lot for us, and their ratings are very solid indeed, so I wouldn't be worried about that. I think uh, what the finance minister did in terms of modest fiscal consolidation has been warmly welcomed by Moody's, and I'm not surprised, uh, because I think in the political context, uh, a year away from an election, the economic context, I think that's been quite a brave thing to do. Um, so I think uh, Moody's have got it about right in terms of their judgment on that. You, you just moved to, uh, not just moved, the last three or four years moved to North Africa. Is, was that going beyond a mandate? Because does the European in uh, mm. uh, the EBRD suggest the realm of where you invest or does it suggest that just the base of where you are from? Well, it was very much, the EU was very much about where we were investing because our shareholders, the governments who own us, 66 of them, uh, include the United States, which is the largest shareholder, Japan, Korea, Australia, Turkey, Mexico. So a lot of non-European shareholders, of course, as well. But it was uh, initially about Eastern Europe, hence the E, I think, very much in it. But it was always thought that because um, we'd been quite successful with the transition in Eastern Europe, that maybe we had some value added also in post-Arab Spring with a political and economic transition in, in North Africa. And that's why we were chosen by the shareholders okay. to move there as well. So will that mean you could move further into, in, into Africa, into South Africa, or is that a... Is that a, is that a that's, that's looked upon as a, a land of huge opportunity in the future. Yes, I, I think Sub-Saharan Africa is a land of great opportunity, but it's not on, uh, okay. on our schedule. What's though. the outlook for North, North Africa? Why, would, why should Indian companies come there? Well, uh, even in bad times, even in difficult global economic situation like this year, um, we expect the countries, the four countries we're in, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt and Jordan, to grow at about four, just over 4% this year. And we expect Morocco to grow over 5% this year. So growth is there, investment opportunities are there, mm -hmm. and Indian companies, of course, have been in that region for a long, long time. Uh, I think India, however, ranks only 11th in those four countries in terms of foreign direct investment. So surprisingly low, given it's not very far away, distance-wise. Many of the countries are known, and I think what we can do, again, a bit like in Eastern Europe, is give comfort to Indian companies wanting to go there. Egypt, I think, is seen by many Indian companies as a future Turkey, okay. once it gets over the political situations that it's going through right now. What's the comfort they're looking for? I mean, so what's the risk that they fear? The risk that they fear is the rules of the game will get changed. That's what any company fears. You go in on the basis of certain rules, certain policies that the government is going to pursue. 
and then you find out, you wake up one morning and you find the government has simply decided... Move the goalposts. Yes, and then your investment is worthless or you, you know, <coughs> and so that's the thing. They need st consistency and stability in the framework of investment. So how are you confident that the four countries they invest in are moving on the path to consistency? Well, what we found is that we have a very strong pipeline of projects in the private sector in all four countries. And, of course, many of the private sector projects don't depend on government action at all. Now, some do, of course. So there are some difficult choices in a place like Egypt about what the power sector tariffs might look like. That would, of course, affect whether we can do more in the power sector. But there are plenty of other projects in the Egyptian economy which have nothing to do with those sort of government policy decisions. Those are safe, and I think it's worth Indian companies trying to get a toehold now in the Egyptian economy or the Moroccan economy while things are changing, while people are being a bit cautious, and to come in with EBRD because with us, the money's safe. Okay, and uh, our interest, uh, are Indian companies showing any sign of interest? Did you yes, they are. Yes, they are. Um, I think one of the things that I found on this uh, visit is for the, the large Indian corporates, they need scale, mm -hmm. firstly, in terms of investment. They also need uh, to piggyback on our local knowledge because we have teams on the ground in all of these countries because they don't have enough knowledge of the economies yet and uh, so we can provide that. So with that sort of tie-up, I think we can actually help them in a way feel comfortable about coming into those economies. What, what sectors do you think Indian companies can uh, really provide the expertise and, uh, and reap those benefits? I think it's a wide range. I think um, some of the obvious sectors, uh, Indian companies uh, could could make a major uh, investment in are petrochemicals. I think um, agricultural equipment would be another area. The IT sector would be another area. Uh, as a, and as well, we've talked about steel in the past. We've talked about uh, leasing, uh, those sorts of things. So there's a range of sectors. I mean, fortunately, most of the Indian corporates that I've talked to are already very diversified. Okay. So they have options in a number of different sectors. Uh, and we can help. We, we also have the same range of expertise in all the sectors. And, and, and do governments in these countries that you invest in, do they view you with less suspicion than they would uh, a pr a, a, another private sector company? Or would, do they view you with uh, suspicion and ideology? Um, they don't really view us in that, uh, with that sort of ideological bent. If you look at um, uh, our work in Eastern Europe, and Turkey and Mongolia and former Soviet Union, we were seen very much as on the side of change. And that's important for any international institution to be seen as the friend of change. Now the same in the Arab Spring. We were not there prior to the Arab Spring. So in a way we're not associated, we don't have the baggage of having been there before. So we are very much associated at the moment in the public mind and the political mind as agents of change. That, that will help your partners as well if they come in with you? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it, uh, that sort of rubs off in a way. All right. So, Sumba, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure talking to you. It's been great fun. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you. Thank you.